the school. My name is Mark Alcorn, I'm acting head this year. Uh, I have to say, thoroughly enjoyed myself up until this point, but uh, we'll see in the next hour and a half how things progress. So, without further ado, I shall introduce the candidates, um, each of whom I'm sure to many of you need no introduction, but uh, as is the, the protocol of this event, I will certainly introduce you. Over here we have Dorothy Thornhill. Dorothy taught for 25 years in Hertfordshire schools, ending as assistant head at Queen's School. In 2012, she received an MBE for her services to local government. And uh, after being a local councillor for 10 years in Watford, she was elected mayor and she has been there for the last 12 years. She's also, I believe, deputy leader of the local government association and has pushed for the Croxley Rail Week and Health Campus. Dorothy Thornhill. On my left, Aidan Cockrell Boyce. Aidan studied theology at Bristol University, has taught for several years whilst working towards his master's, which he's achieved, and he's now in his second year of a doctorate while still teaching part time. I am in awe of this man already. He's committed to making public transport in Watford viable for shoppers and commuters to get them out of their cars. Here, here to that. Okay, on my right is Richard Harrington. <laughs> so well known to many of you. Um, he was elected MP for Watford in May of 2010. And he's uh, been a member of the International Development Select Committee, General Secretary of the All Party Kashmir Group, and Vice Chair of the All Party Film Group as well. And in 2013, he played a significant role in getting a law passed criminalising unlawful subletting of social housing. Um, he's also in a previous life worked for Truitt and supports Watford and Chelsea FC. <laughs> and also on my right hand side we have Nick Lincoln uh, representing UKIP. Now Nick lives in Watford, works in Radlett and runs his own business I understand. Nick prides himself on never holding elected office. And he describes himself as a small government, libertarian kind of guy. Um, he wants to get um, out of people's way and encourage them who want to make, want to better themselves and stay on the right side of the law. Nick Lincoln. Last but certainly not least, Matt Tomei, uh, here on my left hand side. Matt is councillor in Holywell Ward and sits on the budget panel, licensing and members development boards. Matt's work in media, working on digital production, communications and supply chain management for companies including the BBC Worldwide. What we need, says Matt, is a Labour government committed to ensuring that jobs, housing and sensible financial management are at the core of how we run the country. Matt Tomo. <laughs> now, we're pleased to have a good number of questions this evening. What we're going to do, what I'm going to do, is to ask the, uh, those who pose the questions to stand up and present their questions to the candidates. So, first of all, uh, Vanessa Levy, please. I live and work in my spot, and you see the benefit immigrants made to our community every day. What difference do the candidates think that immigrants have made to Watford? Okay. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Nick actually to start off there. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you, Vanessa, for your question. What UKIP are opposed to is mass, uncontrolled immigration from Europe, which has fundamentally changed large parts of our nation and not necessarily for the better. Now I know Aidan, for argument's sake, may well say later on that we're having our cake and eating it with immigration. We are not. We are categorical. We want a points-based system where the best and brightest can come to this country. We do not want mass uncontrolled immigration. But immigration is vital to this country and that is our start. I think anybody who lives in this country or particularly who lives in areas like this which are very diverse is well aware of the massively positive impact which, which 
immigration has, both on the economy and on the culture of our country. There is so little leadership from Labour, the Lib Dems, and the Conservative parties. There's a lot of talk about listening to the people about immigration. I think there should be more leadership. People are frightened of change. People are frightened of difference. We need leadership. We need a political party that stands up and says, immigration is good, and I'm proud to be a, from a country that welcomes immigration. Thank you, Mark. Um, Nick, I, I don't often publicly disagree with you, but um, in the spirit of tonight, I think you've given a very reasonable and balanced talk on immigration. A lot of people support UKIP because they're perceived to be the part, it's like people's fears about immigration. Now, no one can say that immigrants are not a valuable part of this community. I mean, I hope in my case, being a couple of generations away, we've done our bit. You know, most of our fathers were in the Second World War, grandparents in the First World War, etc. I, I don't think that's dispute. But what a government's got to do is strike the right balance between welcoming those into the UK that have a lot to offer and trying to restrict those that want to abuse the system or that are here illegally. Because people come here to work. They come here to live, work, pay their taxes and be responsible members of society. And it's government's job to try and plan things like housing, school places, medical um, facilities, etc. I'd certainly say the Labour government before and possibly the Conservative government before that have allowed immigration of it. And I think the Immigration Act of 2014, which was fully supported by the coalition, was stopping people from coming in and claiming out of work benefits straight away, getting on the housing list straight away, and all these things I think are absolutely right. And I congratulate immigrants, the immigrant community, first generation as well as the second and third generation, I congratulate them for the contribution they've made to this country. Mm. What we have is a thriving and prosperous town which has good community relations. It's actually happened by the kind of communities we've got in Watford and the way they integrate, interact and the way we all work together. And part of my job as the Mayor, and I lived in West Watford for 14 years, um, has been to bring people together. But the bottom line is this, the reason Nick and UKIP have uh, come to prominence in the way that we have is that the mainstream parties have neglected genuine concerns that people have about immigration. And when our children can't get into schools, we want answers. When social housing is scarce, we want answers. Um, the coalition has only just restored exit and entry control so that we can actually count people in and count people out. Um, and I also think Parliament should have the annual oversight. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Okay. Libya, of course, is an absolute nightmare. Another foreign war that we got involved in. Cameron and Sarkozy couldn't wait to kick it off. It was a pretty despotic regime there. It is now actually a horrendous regime. Could you get to your the Libyan crisis, crisis, okay, which is Thank terrible. These people on this boat is absolutely terrible. Today, as I understand it, it is news. This European asylum policy overrides and abrogates our own asylum laws. It's more of our sovereignty going away, and it will mean that we will take these asylum seekers and they will be dispersed throughout Europe. And, uh, and there's plenty of ideas. The Australians, for argument's sake, turn the people back and don't let them land on their boats. in North Africa, you European Union talking about this and organising it where people can go. I don't think take in this country and in Europe we have the scope or the capability to take these people, some of whom who are coming here are not people that are particularly pleasant and ISIS has said this on the record, so we're not a fan of it. Yeah, I, I could not be part of any political party or government that would send people back to their deaths. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm in favour of international aid and everything, which I know you're not, Nick, is because we have to stop well, these circumstances happening yeah. in the first place. And I do accept what you said about the cause of the situation in Libya, by the way. I don't think that's a stupid point at all. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think absolutely, you know, we, we do share a responsibility as being part of the EU to help solve these problems. But I think what you're seeing with these situations is, um, you know, a, a, a really classic example of the international community failing to deal with a set of circumstances properly and in the right way. Um, and so I think without wanting to you know, sound trite about it, we do need a much better and more concerted effort to solve these problems. And uh, I don't think that the proposal, obviously I don't think the proposal that should be people back is the, is the right solution. Okay, thank you very much Matt. We're going to move on. Well, the man who did have his hand up second, please ask a question. Very quickly, my son is uh, turning 18 and will be going to university next year. Um, he's part of the trend, done very well at school and has got an offer for the top of university. What I want to speak about is all the promises about education, all the parents with young children here, is when my son goes to school or to university, so he's going to be saddled for £45,000 per month. He lives in West Watford on the fairly modest income, won't be able to help them at the moment and pay off any of that debt. Going back five years, quite a few people in this country would have voted Lib Dem based on a pledge that party made yeah. on tuition fees. How can any of these five panellists here who say they'll do this, do that, do this, do that, actually promise and actually deliver and not go back on pledges they made to buy votes for people that then attracted later on during the government? coalition we learned a huge lesson and that was not to make pledges when both of your main potential partners had no intention of carrying through and I think that's the fundamental thing that we failed to get across um, you know we entered into a coalition and whoever we had gone with mm. Labour were not going to uh, revoke the tuition fees in fact Labour introduced tuition fees. Um, yes I'm not going to start on the main tuition just to say, Dorothy, I've been involved in the debate at the time. I would say this. One, you actually signed the coalition agreement for the Lib Dem Party, which clearly was in breach of the manifesto. But secondly, the argument that Nick Clegg used then was not the new spin argument. It was that they looked at the books. The situation was much worse than we thought, which is absolutely correct. And that's why he went to the tuition fees. So the whole... I, I do you know, we have lots of money into low education as well. The money should be going right across the board up to the end of university. Not from four years old up to 18 years old. That's an argument on tuition fees. I, I would defend tuition fees on, on two grounds. First thing, I was very lucky. I had no tuition fees and nothing like that. But the guy who bloody served me my lunch at Keeble College, Oxford, who was 17 years old from Cowley in Oxford, his tax was paying for my lunch. So I took the view, providing one, it was free for everybody when they went, and two, the repayments were of this kind of money. First of all, of triggering over a certain income, so that if they were in employment, uh, you know, not if they weren't in employment when they were higher paid, that the amount of money they paid back was, I, in my mind, I put equivalent to the sort of money that uh, people would pay for leisure. So, for example, um, the people that work for me, it's about £70 per month now that they're paid. 
So that's why I support them. Thank you very much. For we live in a country where it's incredibly difficult to get a job unless you have a degree. So it's profoundly undemocratic to say that if you can't afford to spend 45 grand on a degree, then you then you're not allowed to you're not allowed to enter the workplace in any meaningful way. The Green Party is the only party which is committed to scrapping tuition fees. And for those people who say that we can't do it, look at Germany, which has a top class university system which is funded by the state. Look at the Netherlands, top, top, top class universities funded by the state free of Thank you very much. In 2010, the Liberal Democrat pledge on tuition fees wasn't just some little aside, it was, a, it was a central plank of your pitch to the country in terms of why they should vote Liberal Democrat. And you reneged on it. And you didn't, and not only did you renege on it, you, you, you went through the yes vote. You could have abstained. You didn't even abstain. I mean, it was, it was outrageous. How do you justify the fact that you introduced the pledge of We'll cut tuition fees from £9,000 to £6,000 if we are elected in there. Okay. Okay, uh, to ask the question that the gentleman positive, I can see why well, there's a lack of faith in politicians. I totally get that. UKIP is the only manifesto that's been independently costed and audited, but take that with a pinch of salt because I'm telling you that. Um, we think Labour's decision that 50% of school leavers should go to university was disastrous, has bankrupted the university system and devalued degrees and served on lots of kids with <coughs> massive debts. The UKIP policy is if you're doing a course in science, technology, engineering, maths or medicine, we will fund you because we need graduates with those skills. Otherwise, I'm afraid the money just ain't there. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>
I think we need to have a sensible discussion about the NHS. I think it's too management heavy, too top heavy. Um, and I think that the NHS to work, we need less people in the NHS pushing paper and more people treating patients. So UKIP policy is to invest on frontline staff, an additional three billion pounds, which will help the Watford Hospital, will help our hospitals across the country. Um, and that is our start. Farm Terrace would not be built on if I was your MP. Um, you can make your mind up the other stuff, but election times, it's like, take your pick, isn't it? We'll spend eight billion more, six billion more, three billion more, five billion more. Anyone can say, because I again saw the situation five years ago, and I spent a lot of time doing what I can to um, alleviate a position where the demands on the NHS, like everything else, like we for education, are much more than anyone ever predicted them to do. Now, as far as GP surgeries, um, it's now seven surgeries, it's expanding, and the technology is there, so that in each area, if you go in, um, it's not your surgery, it's a, it's a nearby one, they've got the medical records and everything like that. That's 16,000 extra GP places. Yes, as Nick said, I said last night, there's no proposal for a new hospital from the hospital trust. There isn't. Meanwhile, five new wards have been opened. Um, in the last five years. Just so that people know, and I didn't know this before, it's gone up from 260 million to 310 million in the last five years. As far as the health campus is concerned, I'm fully in support of the council's policy. I think it's the gateway to a fantastic urban regeneration scheme and the development, I hope, of a new hospital on the site. But it does seem to me that that land has got to be part of the redevelopment of the and we have your constituents, not against them. Um, <laughs> I think that when we are speaking um, with regard to the allotments, you know, if, if there are two sides to a story, you actually have to take one side, so you can't speak, you know, you've got to speak one against the other. Twelve years ago, I was taken to the top of the Princess Michael of Kent building by the then Chief Executive David Laws. He looked down and he said to me, he said, um, we've just had a health and safety report on this building. It's in a terrible state. There was a proposal on that land for um, a warehousing development, which frankly, in opposition, we opposed. It was, it was, it was very low value, giving very little in jobs and, and in regeneration. I went back to the council and actually said, they went down, they came back and said, not only can we help the hospital in the future, but we can actually have a significant regeneration down there that will be considerably better than a load of warehouses. What I have done is kept the door open for our hospital to improve, expand off its footprint. You can't knock down Princess Michael of Kent unless you've got something built in its place. The decision to include the allotments was a difficult one. Nobody would want to upset a group of residents who actually care about what they do which is why the allotments will be completely replaced, why the allotment holders will be offered new sites, new sheds and compensation of £1,000 in order to facilitate um, the, their move. The new finance director actually said health campus will be built in seven years and there will be jobs, there will be homes, there will be more public open space than currently exists down there. Allotments are not public open space. The road is significant, it's being built now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm well aware of the, that the opinions run high on this particular topic as we are. So can I ask a uh, lady at the front there just to make a comment, an observation please? I agree, we all agree completely. If we thought that the hospital was in any way or in any shape position to go ahead and desperately need to develop a lot of new land, we would give it to them. So what we're saying is hold it off, wait for all the candidates because this can be changed, wait until you know that the hospital are definitely in a position where they need the land and then apply for the new regulation. Thank you very much. <laughs> So my mum's actually been a GP in Watford for 20 plus years and we can't often at the dinner table get all the effing and blinding about how whatever, whatever party's in charge, the approach on the NHS is completely wrong. My mum's words, not mine, what we really need is a huge 
national health campaign to educate people how to use the NHS. Not parties randomly chucking more nurses and money at it. We need a huge, great big health campaign to educate people how to use the NHS. What does each party think about that? Okay, thank you very much for that. I mean, I think you're actually right. I go to GP surgeries myself and see people there for all sorts of reasons. Um, very, from really serious to quite trivial ones. I think people do need a lot of education in what to go where and, and why. Our hospital is, is in a mess. Um, it's had its recent inspection, and believe you me, it, we're not going to come out of it smelling of roses. The hospital has actually been declining in many ways for about the last 20 years. Um, the house price boom that has swept London in the past 18 months has reached Watford. What steps will the candidates take to ensure that there is sufficient affordable housing and a market which is accessible to first-time buyers, as well as looking after the needs of those who rent? Thank you very much. Uh, we'll start uh, with uh, Dorothy, please. Um, well, I think you'll find that we all say in our manifestos that we'll build more houses and we'll argue the trust as to, ha as to how many houses we have. <laughs> Um, but the reality is that we absolutely have got a housing crisis and we must build more homes. The problem is we've all turned from nimbies to bananas. So not in my backyard has become build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. And then the actual reality that we need to build homes. And that actually what we need is a radical building programme, like after the war. You know, we're actually talking about the need for ten garden cities, five major new conurbations. And of course that means as a society we have to have a discussion about green belt and the amount of land that is actually built on. Um, we were told last night it was what percent, eight percent or something. I thought, thought it was closer to 14. But the bottom line is we have to we actually have to be more radical because I think towns like Watford can't stand uh, more town cramming and uh, and and more um, back garden development. Thanks, Dorothy. Nick, please. <laughs> Okay, well I think there is an issue here, there's an unsatiable that we've seen demand for housing, especially in Watford, which has seen a lot of building over the years, and there's still an acute housing shortage in Watford, and there is an underlying demand for housing, that is not going to go away. I think these little things around the margins, like rights of buy and so forth, all we're doing is changing the ownership of housing, not increasing the housing stock. Rent controls. It's on the case with rent controls. Rent controls have been an outright disaster where they've been tried. Manhattan, New York, in the 40s through to the 70s had rent controls in Harlem and by the Bronx, in the Bronx, and by the 1980s most of those buildings were burnt down because the landlords got more money than burned them down. Notting Hill and Ladbroke Grove, nice and swanky now, absolute slums in the 50s when we had rent controls. And people like Peter Rackman, who the more mature people in the audience might know, was, he's not alive, I can slide him, was a hoodlum landlord operating with rent controls and to get the people out and get people who <coughs> weren't subject to them, he evicted them with thugs. Rent controls distort the market. We haven't got enough houses, we've got way too much demand, we need to be creative with our brownfield sites in this country. We think we can build around <coughs> 2 million houses on brownfield sites, we need to incentivise people to build on brownfield because it's not easy. We also have 300,000 or more, nobody's quite sure, empty property. We need to incentivise, with a stick, perhaps more than a carrot, the owners of those properties to release them onto the market, either for sale or for rent. I know you don't like me saying this, but the elephant in the room is the insatiable demand for housing. Until we treat the populace with respect and have a conversation about this, this ain't going to go away. Okay, thank you very much. what Dorothy said. I think uh, building new garden cities is an excellent thing. Unfortunately, it's taken 20 years with public inquiries and everything. It's proven almost impossible. Can we force it on people, Dorothy? It's very difficult. We've tried it with a, with a democratic position. But something's got to give. Uh, blaming it on immigrants causing the demand is abject nonsense. Richard, to be able to 300,000 people in this coming last year. This town of what? 90,000 people. We need three towns the size of what?
The talking about no, building houses, you cannot put And a million British people live in Spain. A million British people live in Spain. A million British people live in Spain. Thank you very much. 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 The idea of the policy is um, not breaking the problem. Of course, tenants and landlords are still going to be able to negotiate the rent. What we're doing is saying, once you've established what that rent is, we're going to limit the amount that you can increase it year on year. Now that just seems fair. It's bringing some certainty to both tenants and to landlords in a market that has been weighted very heavily against tenants for many years. So yeah. I think it's a good proposal. Um, we're building less than half the amount of housing that we need to build in this country, and house building has been at the lowest level since 1920. So we're going to build 200, or our figure is 200,000 new homes a year by 2020. The quest for a million homes. Now, some of that we will reserve for first-time buyers, because obviously first-time buyers are struggling. I think the average age of a first-time buyer now is in their, in their mid-30s. Um, we will devolve power to local authorities so that they can more easily build social housing. And we, of course, have the, uh, the uh, 5 billion future homes fund uh, around that as well. Um, to protect the affording, affordable housing element of development, which has been allowed to be kicked aside or reduced in number and, and various other caveats to get, get out of having to deliver it. Obviously, we're going to, uh, as we have recently announced, remove stamp duty on properties up to 300,000 pounds to help them. And a first call for local people in terms of new development so that we can keep people who want to stay within their community within their community. It's very important to do that. Um, Three-year tenancies, I mean, keeping, keeping rent increases to CPI to me seems to be the right thing to do. If Rich has met a, um, a, 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 a landlord who is able to square that circle of ever-increasing prices with the fact that already going up by RPI at the moment anyway, then, um, then surely we're bang on the money in terms of the proposed. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. Now, there's a lot of people in this country who have mortgages. If you do what Aidan suggests, there'll be a lot of people in negative equity. The banks will be in hot, and we could have a banking crash yet again. Pensions are tied up also in property. Now, do you really want a lot of people in this country to end up with negative equity in their homes? Is that your policy? That, that's what will happen if we build 500,000 extra sessions. Like no, you said about market forces, you were against market forces. No, no, no. I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm against market forces. I'm saying that a fetishization of the market leads people to an impasse where they feel they can't build social housing. It's evident. The Labour Party didn't, the Conservative Party didn't, the Lib Dem Party didn't. I'm not saying we need to combat market forces. I'm saying if you take away that fetishization. You said that last week, uh, the last after you 